Have you ever been flying along in DCS and have this happen to you? In real life, fuses are there to keep this from happening, and in this video, we'll go over how they work. When you ask most DCS players what this switch does, they usually answer by saying it lets you choose which fuse on the bomb you get to use. But what exactly do those fuses do? We'll answer that question in this video. Keep in mind that ordnance fusing isn't fully modeled in DCS, but we'll go over how it would work if they were. Fuses typically come in four different types that they use to determine how they're going to detonate the ordnance that they're attached to. Impact fuses go off after they hit something or after a predetermined time delay after impact. The delay is something that you set if you want your ordnance to penetrate cover before going off. Proximity fuses include a miniature Doppler radar set that measures distance to nearby surfaces. When the time between radar pulses and returns gets to a certain minimum, it sets off the explosive train. Time fuses contain a clock that counts down from release and then sets off the bomb at a predetermined time. You would typically use these to go and get a bomb to go off at a certain altitude above the target to maximize fragmentation. But there's a big downside to these fuses. That clock can only be set from the ground, so you can only employ it from one profile. Otherwise, you run the risk of having the bomb plow into the ground before detonation or going off too high to maximize its effects. Hydrostatic fuses go off at a planned depth underwater. Inside the fuse is a small balloon that fills with water from the outside and presses up against the spring. When enough pressure builds up inside the balloon to overcome the spring's tension, it releases a firing pin that starts detonation. Before a bomb is loaded on your plane, it has to be assembled and its fuse properly set to match your mission profile. Here we can see a Mark 82 before it's assembled. You can add on different tails and even noses to change its mission profile. You can attach high drag tail kits like the Snake Eye or Air Inflatable Retarder if you want the bombs to detonate well behind the aircraft in a low level, low angle release. There are also laser guidance kits like the Paveway 2 that turns our dumb bomb into one that chases a laser spot. And of course, JDAM guidance tail kits that let us target GPS coordinates with our ordnance. Inside the Mark 82's casing, there are openings in the nose and tail to fit fuses and a couple conduits running down the middle for lanyards. These lanyards are what's used to initiate the fuses. So when you select the nose fuse, that lanyard will remain attached to your aircraft's weapon pylon when you release the bomb. As the lanyard is pulled free of the bomb, it will activate that fuse. The same thing happens at the rear if you select the tail fuse. Since there are way too many fuses to cover in one video, we'll just go over a couple to give you an idea of how they work. Here we have a simple time-delayed nose fuse. A wind vane is used to keep track of time after release. This wind vane is locked in place by an arming wire that is attached to the pylon, just like the internal lanyard. Once the bomb is released and that arming wire is pulled free, the wind vane will spin freely. This is when the fuse starts counting down to seconds until it's safely away from the aircraft before arming the weapon. This fuse also happens to be an impact fuse. It takes about 250 g's of force to move the fuse rearward and cause a firing pin to strike a detonator. This means you will need a certain amount of speed and angle if you want the fuse to activate when it hits the target. Now you might be asking, what happens if I'm off? The answer is you won't get a boom. And if your dive angle is shallow enough, the bomb might even ricochet off the ground. High drag tail kits help with this problem by increasing the impact angle. Fuses oftentimes have an indicator on them to let you know if they are armed. For this particular fuse, there is a warning window that shows a letter A on a red background when the fuse is armed. This is why you will see pilots and ground crews do a check on their weapons before takeoff. You don't want to send a plane into the air with weapons that are not in a safe condition. The tail fuse is just like a nose fuse, but has a few limitations. Since it's inside the bomb's body, it can't be visually inspected once the tail kit is installed, and you can't have a wind vane directly attached to the fuse. There are some external sensors out there that can be attached to a tail fuse, but we don't have one in this case. This fuse has an electrical timer that is powered by a battery to delay arming by up to 20 seconds. An impact delay of up to a quarter second can also be dialed in to allow the weapon to penetrate cover before detonating. 
While this fuse is electrically operated, there are some that are operated by the sudden g-forces that come right after the fins of a snake eye deploy. That's why it's important to keep your speed high with high drag bombs. At low speeds, the fins won't fully deploy, which means there won't be enough g-force to arm the fuse and you'll end up with a dud. Another important thing to know about the position of a fuse is that it shapes the blast. When a detonation is initiated from the nose, the explosion tends to be channeled toward the tail of the bomb. So a nose fuse would be more useful if you wanted to cover soft targets in a large area with fragmentation. But if you wanted to channel most of your energy into a hardened bunker, then a tail fuse might work better. Now that we've gone over how fuses work, I hope you have a better understanding of what their purpose is. Not only do they help with shaping the bomb's effect on the target, but they also help keep the pilot and aircraft safe. I hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching.